All right, many of you know that we have been discussing the idea of 1 Corinthians. We've been kind of going it scripture by scripture. We were in chapter 1. Last week, we were in chapter 4. Today, we skip ahead to chapter 8. There's some good stuff in between those, but let's face it, we only got four weeks for the sermon series, so we have to fit all 16 chapters into four weeks, and here we go, chapter 8 tonight. Before I even get started, though, I do want to share with you a quick story. Tonight's message is entitled, Understanding Your Influence. Believe it or not, the choices you make today, they are powerful. The choices you make today are important. Not only do they affect you, they affect the people around you. And as teenagers, that's hard to understand. Right? Because we, we live for ourselves, we think about ourselves, it's about what we want, what we can get, what we can be, and too often, we forget about the people to the left and to the right of us. But every choice you make, get ready for this, not only does it affect you, but it affects those around you. So make sure you're making the choices that honor God, that lift up God, and not puff yourself up. Let's face it, the Corinthian church has been all about this. They've been puffed puffing themselves up, making themselves look better than what they actually are, and it's causing Paul to give them a nice, gentle, sometimes not so gentle rebuke. He says things like, hey, don't puff yourself up. Watch what you're doing. I know you think you know, but really you don't know. You need to live the life that honors Christ. Before we get to tonight's scripture verse, I do want to share with you a quick what if scenario? You're ready for this? A what if scenario? It's it's not factual. It hasn't actually happened, but it's one of those just to get you thinking. So we begin like this. You ready? You ready for story time? All right. What if? What if it's summertime, which is about to be? Can't wait. Met you in the summer. Looking forward to it. We're going to have a blast this summer. But what if, in my planning for summer, I started getting on the Google? You know what I'm talking about? The Google. It's on the line, also known as online, just playing with you. It's the internets, you know, where you get on, you, you can go to Google, type in some things, fun things to do in the summer. You get it. Okay. What if I'm doing that? I'm doing my research. I'm trying to come up with a fun activity for you and for me and for everybody else, and I zero in on this one activity. Windstar Casino in Oklahoma. Okay? Okay. I know what you're thinking. That's, that, that's a little bit different. Okay? What if I tell you, we're going to go to the casinos, and we're going to put money in the slot machine so that we might be able to win. Okay, if I do that, guess what's about to happen? You're going to be on a youth pastor search. You're looking for a new pastor to lead your group because I will be gone. And that's fair because obviously that is a place that a youth pastor shouldn't be in. And it's definitely not a trip to plan for an entire group of teenagers. I think that's obvious. I think that's obvious. And why is that the case? If you look at the idea of gambling... It's very addictive in nature. Very addictive. You start, it's hard to stop. You get a little taste of that action, a little taste of that, that change falling into the coin slot, and you're like, ooh, I got to keep going. Ooh, mama, we need more of this. And so you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, and the next thing you do, it becomes an idol. Suddenly, instead of going to church on Sundays, guess where you find yourself at? The casino. Suddenly, instead of doing the things of God, guess what you're doing? You're smoking a little pipe, putting pennies in that coin machine. It's not a good place to find yourself. Not a good place to find yourself. Let's face it. If you walk into the casino because you got to go to the bathroom or something like that, and you see Miss Brianna in there just slotting away, <laughs> what's your first move? You're saying, hey, Pastor Plunk, Pastor Plunk. I see your youth pastor's wife, and she is gambling. Gambling. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, we have to start looking for another guitar person. Okay. So we understand that. That's, that's not a far-fetched example. You don't expect to see a pastor in the casino. But why is it okay for a mom and dad or a brother and sister who claim to be Christian to find themselves in the same spot? 
Okay, we, we place pastors on a pedestal saying, they got to be perfect. They, they got to make the right choices. They got to say the right things. They got to be perfect. They got to live in this nice little fishbowl where we can watch every action they do. But yet, as Christians, we go off and live whatever it is we want to do. We make whatever choice we want to make for what pleases us. If it's not okay for me to be in there, guess what? It's not okay for you to be in there. And if it's not okay for you to be in there, guess what? It's not okay for grandmama to be in there, okay? Now, I know that's just a funny example. We are to flee from evil and pursue God. It is absolutely vital that we do, in fact, not only does your witness affect you, but it affects those around you. The choices you make not only affects you, but it affects those around you. We need to understand our influence and how the choices we make not only affect us, but they affect everybody around us. So let me, let me continue on in this what-if scenario. What if your parents took you to go see a rated R movie full of blood, cussing, and sexuality? Okay, um, uncomfortable? Does that make you feel uncomfortable? Good, it should. Because that's not what parents do. We've got to protect, we've got to shield our family from evil things. That's my job as a dad. Not only am I there to physically protect my daughter, but I'm there to spiritually protect my daughter as well. All right, another what-if scenario. What if your grandparents, now your grandparents I'm talking about, the people you love who are God-fearing, who do whatever they can to honor God, who are ch at church 24-7 on Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, Thursday nights, whenever the doors are open. What if they say, hey, hey, Rebecca, I got a treat for you. A nice cold one, a nice ice cold beer, and you can drink it in front of your little brothers and your little sisters. I know you don't got those, but let's pretend you do. Again, that makes you feel uncomfortable, doesn't it? And it should, because that's not what God is calling you to do. All right, let's take it a step further. What if I, as a pastor, or Pastor Plunk even, let's take it to the next step. What if Pastor Plunk walks up to you and says, hey, I got two tickets for dinner for you and your sweetheart to go to a Buddhist temple. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? Good. It should. Because these people in leadership above you, in these what if such scenarios, are telling you to do something that is contrary to what the Bible teaches, is contrary to the ways of Christ. And we know from that that we should probably stay clear. Now, let's face it, Pastor Plunk would never give you those two tickets. Your grandma would never give you that nice ice-cold beer. Your parents would never take you to a rated R movie. It's not going to happen. Why? Because they love you, and they're there to protect you both spiritually and physically. They're there to love you and nurture you so that you can become the person God is calling you to be. Those ideas should make us feel uncomfortable because it is someone you trust offering something that God encourages us to abstain from. We are called to lead by example. We are called at times to, to follow God's path. That means we should abstain from certain places that hinder our testimony. I think, I, and here's the problem. You know, I went to a Christian college. You know, Christian colleges place nice limits on you. They say, hey, you got to be here by 12 o'clock, okay? Uh, you can't wear holes in your jeans, you, you can't hold your girlfriend or boyfriend's hand. You can't dance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They had some pretty interesting rules. I don't fault them for that. Uh, it is what it is. But because of that, I used to think the Christian walk is a little bit legalistic. It's just a bunch of to-dos, rights and wrongs, and I don't buy every single one of those. I used to think this way. But then I listened to the words of Paul tonight, and I understand the full context. I know you think you're wise right now, and you're the smartest crayon in the crayon box, right? We're wise. We, we think we know more than our parents. We think we're smarter. We also think we're more hip. And you might be that, but I promise you, you're, you're not wiser than a 30, 40, 50, 60-year-old. You're not. Even if you think you are, you're not. That 18-year-old, 20-year-old, 24-year-old Dustin, he was foolish compared to the person I am today. I'm calling myself foolish because I didn't have it all together. Thought I did. I thought I was smart. I thought I was wise. And I made good decisions, but I didn't always make the best decisions. And so tonight, as we read the words of Paul, I want you to realize 
I know you think your way is best, but it's not always. And sometimes we need to follow God's advice for our own life instead of our own advice for our own lives. First, First Corinthians chapter 8, I used to think this idea was overly religious and unfair, but now I see the full value of it. Now I think following God is just wise. Let's get to, the, to tonight's scripture verse. There's going to be three different sections of this verse that we're going to be reading, so y'all stay with me. It's a journey. I'm not going to answer the question front and foremost. It's going to be at the very end of these three sections of scripture, but you don't even know that question right now. And I'm not going to share it with you right now because we need to read the scripture verse. So let's get down to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Y'all say 8. Troy Aikman number 8. You can say it. No? You don't like him? It's cool. He's old. It's cool. (laughs) All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Now about food sacrifice to idols. You're like, what? Yeah, we're going there. We know that we all possess knowledge. Quote, unquote. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. Whoever loves God is known by God. Let me say that again. Whoever loves God is known by God. That's important because that lets us be motivated by his ways instead of our own ways. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, quote unquote, and that there was no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there was but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. All right, before we even get to the nitty-gritty of this passage, Paul is setting the ground rules. What's going on? The Corinthian church sent him a letter. And you can know that by the quotation marks that you saw in some of those passages. For instance, you saw the quotation mark around, we all possess knowledge. Now, apparently, the Corinthian church, as we've been discussing, thought their knowledge was superior to the knowledge of Christ, and so it allowed them to become a little bit arrogant, a little bit egotistical, a little bit of a know-it-all. Do you all know a know-it-all? Don't answer that. No, we've all been there before. For the Corinthian church, it was easy to let their knowledge puff themselves up. But yet, Paul is saying, hey, I know you think you're smart. I know you think you're wise. But love builds up. You need to model your life after love. The love that you're going to learn about next week, you need to be motivated by love because that love is from Christ. Therefore, a.k.a., you need to be motivated by Christ. So then, about food sacrificed to idols. That is something we probably don't understand too well right here, right now. Because... In the Corinthian day, you could just walk out, you see idols everywhere. They have these nice little restaurants. People go eat sacrificed meat that were used to idols. And it's a big deal for them. For us, it's weird, right? Uh, you don't see, you're not going to go outside and see a big old statue of a calf and people all around it worshiping and eating. You don't see that. You see restaurants, but you don't see idols. Okay, we understand that. But before Paul even begins to address that, he begins to kind of set the ground rules. Like, you know how you play Monopoly, and beforehand you kind of go over the rules? That's what Paul's doing, saying, hey, I I know you have knowledge, and I know that although Christ might say this food is clean, and it doesn't matter if you eat it or not, because it's only food, um, there's a certain way. There is only one God. We know that. And we only have a relationship with that God because of Jesus Christ. We know that. We know that uh, you might know some things, but you don't know all things. So here's what we need to do. We need to live our life in such a way that honors God. We need to know the truth, and we need to seek the truth. By doing so, we will be known by God. That's the most important thing with this life, you know. You only get one shot at this life. Many of you know that. Just one chance. What are you doing with that life? Are you using it to grow in your relationship with God? Because we know one day we're going to come face to face with him. What's he going to say about us? What's he going to think about us? Is he going to say, hey, 
well done, good and faithful servant. You've served me all the days of your life. Come into my kingdom. Or is he going to say other things like, why didn't you follow me enough? Why didn't you uh, become my disciple? Why didn't you reach out to the lost and broken? Why did you ch- pursue your own interests instead of the interests I had for you? The issue at hand that Paul is speaking on is should Christians eat with their pagan friends at the idol's temple? Far-fetched idea. Let me break it down. Should we endorse the things that are evil? That's an easier way of saying it. Should we put ourselves in compromising situations that God does not approve of? Before Paul addresses the situation as right or wrong, he speaks to the truth about Christ in order that they might set an equal playing field. He says, hey guys, we know this. There's one God. Although people might believe in idols, we know that's not the case. We know that's not the truth. They don't exist. But they don't know that. But you do. Therefore, honor God. It is right to say that idols are not real. It is right to say that idols are not God, since there is only one. But it is also right to say, guys, that people do struggle with idolatry. People struggle with idolatry, whether we like it or not. If we take this text and we place it in our own life, here and right now, I think there are people, maybe in this room, who struggles with idolatry. We say, you know what? We're going to choose this over my relationship with God. We're going to spend hours on YouTube instead of reading the Scripture. We're going to do this activity and that activity and that activity in place of the things God is calling me to, and in place of the God events that are created for me. We say, I'm not going to go to church because I got baseball, softball, band. What else we got? Math. We got academics, we got boyfriends, we got girlfriends, we got friends, we got birthday parties, we got this, we got that, we got that. We got a lot of stuff, and you're a busy people. But I pray that we never get so caught up in our busyness or our own idolatry that we miss out on the things God is calling us to. The Christians serve the one and true living God. You serve the only God that truly exists. And they only have access to God through Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul is saying in these first couple uh, things, the first couple of scriptures. He's setting the ground rules about the idea of food being sacrificed to idols, whether we should eat that or not, or whether we should even be at the temple or not. Verse 7, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as being sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat it, and no better if we do. What Paul is saying in this moment to the Corinthian church, he's saying, you might know that idols don't exist. You might know that there was only one way to heaven. You might know that there was only one God. But your friends, they don't know that. They don't know that. Our friends in your classroom, the friends that you make at your work environment, the friends on your teams, they don't know that. And the problem occurs when we sit at that idol worship table, at that restaurant, eating food sacrificed to foreign gods. We're right along with them doing the same thing that they are doing. For them, this is not right because they think they are eating something that was sacrificed to an idol, and they think that's okay. Not only that, because of that, because of their conscience that it's weak, they are defiled because of it. They are sinning because of that. And if we're sitting right there beside them, Corinthian church, guess what? You're leading them into sin. It's not the food. It's not the food. It's not what you're eating. It's not what you're putting in your body. It's the act. It's the influence that you're having over that person that matters. Not everybody knows the truth about God in his ways. We should not allow our knowledge to make us greater than our brother these pagan friends that were so accustomed to doing this. They walk out on the street corner, they see it right there, and it's normal to them. But that doesn't mean it's right. 
And if as a Christian, we sit alongside of our brother in that environment and we say, yes, I'm eating this food. Can you imagine what that can have, the kind of impact that would have on your brother or your sister? The food in question does not bring us close to God nor push us away, but it is important to know the real issue at stake. It is more than just about the food in this situation. It's about the influence. It's about the influence. It's about the effect that you're having on your brother or your sister. It's more important than just you. Verse 9, this is where it really hits home. Paul really makes it clear. Be careful. Be careful. If you can learn anything tonight, know this. Be careful out there. I know I sound like your mom or dad. Sound like Aunt Debbie. I love her to death. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Christians, you might be allowed to sit in the temple. But that doesn't always mean you should. You might be allowed to go to that party, but that doesn't always mean you should. You might join in on the gossip conversation in middle school, but that doesn't mean you should. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, and with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Paul is helping us here. Paul is showing the way for us here. Paul is teaching us a leadership lesson and an important lesson. As we live, we should always live in such a way to bring people closer to God. Uh, you, you know I say that all the time. Uh, our, our life should be an act of worship, a daily act of worship to him. The choices we make should always be to honor God. Whether you're a pastor or not, it doesn't matter. We're all called to the same standard. And Paul is saying, if you're joining in with a sinful activity, you're causing them to think it's okay. Not only are you causing them to sin, but you're sinning against God yourself. It's about that compromising situation. And even more, it's about that leadership situation. Those who do not possess the knowledge of Christ is shown as being weak in the Scripture. By entertaining someone in an idol's temple, even though the food may be okay, guess what? The, Corinth, the Corinthians are becoming a stumbling block to the pagans, to those who don't believe in God. And Paul says, Christ died for them too. Basically, they are not setting the proper example, and they are hurting their Christian witness. Did you know today that we all have a Christian witness? A Christian witness, we all have one. The choices you make impact that Christian witness. I've often heard people say, I don't go to church because the people that are in there are hypocrites. In Brownsville, Texas, we would say that all the time, almost like we would find it in the Bible. We would say, I don't go there because I know that pastor, I know that leader, I know that student who claims to love God, and I see what they do on a Friday, I see what they do on a Thursday, I see how they cheat on their algebra test, and I want nothing to do with that. The choices we make impact our Christian witness. The food is not the problem in this moment. The scene is. Idol worship is not okay, and eating at this restaurant is considered an endorsement. The individuals in question are leading others away from God, and that's dangerous. They're causing them to eat unclean meat, and that is a major problem. Therefore, the Corinthian church should say, you know what? I'm not going to eat at this temple because it endorses a false god and endorses an idol over the one true God. And I can't do that to my brother or sister. Some of you know I grew up in a, uh, not the easiest of situations. Um, alcohol was everywhere in my family. Everybody drinks in my family. Uh, and so as a pastor, I have a responsibility. If I go to the next family gathering, whether it's Easter, a birthday party, a, a Christmas party, and they're all out there drinking, and I pull up next to them, and I pop open a cold one and start chugging it down. What would that do to my witness? It would lessen it. It would cheapen it. 
they would say, why would I ever follow Dustin if he's doing the same thing that I'm doing? This is my family I'm talking about. I can't do that to them. They're too important. Their eternity is at stake. I'm not doing that. But yet so many times I feel like we, as Christians, make sacrifices like that. I'm not saying you go out and drink with your family. I know you don't. But we do make choices that are sinful, that causes our, our neighbors beside us to also go into sin. And we need to be careful of that. We need to be careful about what we're spending our time on, what we're utilizing the gift that we have. What are we using that for? The worship of false gods in Paul's day is not as clear as it is today. And I think from this passage, we can see it is pretty obvious that we should stay away from eating at temples towards separate religions. That's way too obvious. We understand that. But let's go a little bit deeper. What does this really mean for us? What can we really take away from this? Here's my point tonight. We should always strive to lead others to God by the way that we live. We should strive to bring people to God instead of pushing them away by the way we live. So let's talk examples. Let's get right down to it, to the nitty-gritty, how we're living. In school, what you're almost out of, some of you, some of you have a long way to go. Just because your friends are doing something doesn't mean you should. So let's look at some examples. Drinking, smoking, cheating on your tests, stealing, so forth. You know what's right and wrong, right? You understand the difference between what's right and wrong. Don't do something to cause someone else to stumble. Um, in high school, many of you guys are in high school and you know that parties exist. I know that you might go to those and say, you know, I'm not drinking. I'm just having water and a Coke. That's it. That's all I'm doing. But you're putting yourself in a compromising situation and you're making it look like it's okay to be there. Now, a birthday party, swim party, that's different. But I'm talking about a party where bad things happen. That's a compromising situation. And with your very presence being there and your witness being there, you might say to your brother or your sister without even communicating it with the words that what they're doing is okay. And it's not. And not only that, it puts you in a pretty precarious situation as well. Let's talk middle school. Because some people are in middle school in here, okay? Uh, so let's say a group of your friends are talking bad about your teachers. They're making fun of them, calling them names, cussing at them, talking back to them. And you say, you know what? I'm going to join in this conversation because I have something to say about Mr. Ferris. Not a good look. Not a good look. You should not be engaging in those conversations. We're called to set the example in faith to not only believers, but to unbelievers as well. So don't put yourself in compromising situations. We may have the right to do something, as long as it's not sin, but that doesn't mean we always should. You will never see me in a casino. You just won't. You will never see me cussing out my brother or sister. You're never going to see me popping a cold one with my aunt or uncle. You're not going to see that. Why? Because my Christian witness is too important. Not only does this put me in a situation of fail, but it puts the friends who don't love God in a position of fail, and that's even worse. So understand your influence. Be careful of your leadership. Like it or not, people watch you as a Christian. I don't always like that, but it's the truth. People watch. So how are you leading them? How are you treating others? How are you treating yourself? Do you find yourself in con Compromising situations? Do you find yourself giving into idolatry or eating at that temple? Where do you find yourself? Not only was, must we abstain from sin, but we also must strive to make sure we don't lead our neighbors into sin. Because that's a bad place to be. And that's what the Corinthian church was doing. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Now as we close, if Brie wanted to come to the stage... Physical idols may not exist the way it did for the Corinthian church. You're not going to go outside and see a big massive statue of Dustin Wilson in all of its glory just hanging out. You're not going to see that. It'll be a lot less subtle. But let's face it, I think sin can be a very big idol in our life. Just like athletes, if we worship our athletes, just like our 
our friends, if we worship our friends, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, if we worship them, whatever the case may be. You're not going to see idolatry as much. But we do understand what sin is. And sin is a big deal in our life. So will we join the crowd in sin? Will we put ourselves in compromising situations to sin? Will we act in, by our actions? Will we cause others to go into sin? Or will we live our life as set apart? It's not legalistic. That was a foolish way of thinking. It's not right or wrong. It's how can I live the best life possible to honor my God? And how can I bring people to know him? That's what this scripture is all about. How do we love God and how do we set a good example? Are we making the choices today that set that good example? Are we making the decisions that we need to make that will honor God on a daily basis? Let me be clear. Tonight's lesson does not mean to not hang around your pagan friends or your friends that do sin. Because let's face it, if we abstain from our friends, guess what? They'll never know God. No, you need to have a real relationship with them, but that doesn't mean you put yourselves in compromising situations for the sake of, I'm a missionary, I'll take care of this. I will show them in a bar, in a sinful situation, how to live. I'll drink water while they're drinking alcohol. I'll say positive while everybody else is cussing. No, don't put yourself in compromising situations. If you want to minister, take them to Chick-fil-A. If you want to make a difference, take them to my house. Have a conversation. Go throw a baseball. Go throw a football. Go swimming. No Speedos, guys. Okay? We still need to have that relationship. But we can't put ourselves in compromising situations that will hurt our Christian witness. Tonight's passage is weird. I'll give you that. In our eyes because we don't go through the same situations. Idol worship was big and obvious for Paul. Today, our idols are less obvious, but sin is easy to spot. I pray that we live our lives in such a way that our actions lead others to God instead of away from God. I pray that we learn from this. I pray that we let it guide our life. It's not about the food. It's about the influence. How are you influencing those around you? Are you leading them to God or away from God? Let me pray of you. God, we love you so much and we're thankful for you. Thankful to be in this place. God, we love you. And we sure thank you. This lesson is hard because we like to do what pleases our, ourselves. And we want to hang around our friends and we want to feel popular and we want to feel accepted. But we can't put ourselves in compromising situations. But we can't place ourselves in situations to sin. And we can't place our buddies in a situation to sin also. I pray that we set the example to the believers, to the unbelievers, about what true faith looks like. It takes you. I pray that you place that desire in our life to follow after you all the days of our life, to honor you with the choices that we make. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think the correct altar call for this moment is what happens out there, what happens when you go outside these doors. So I pray that you're challenged tonight, challenged to make the right choices, the choices that are honor God, the choices that will make a difference in your friend's life, when they see you and they know you're choosing God over fun, that's going to make a pretty big witness to them. Don't hurt your witness. Build up your witness by love. It takes love. And you have that love because of what Jesus Christ did for you. Cool. Know that I love you. I pray that this wasn't too hard. Um, I'm just following 1 Corinthians. And it's been a doozy so far. Come back next week for uh, the love portion of of Corinthians. Going to be a great week for crew nights. Uh, we got about three minutes before we let you go. So with that said, Amy, come on up. We're going to talk about Speed the Light for a little bit. I'm not taking up an offering, but I want you to be reminded of what Speed the Light goes, and then we'll be dismissed. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to pray real
real fast and just over our hearts for the rest of the year guys we're about to get to like the halfway point so remember that the goal for the total year is 20,000 right so have y'all given your thousand yet no okay I mean I'm joking but kind of serious at the same time like add up how much you kind of given already this year and then let's see how much more we have to go um kind of on our own okay god i just thank you so much for tonight god thank you so much for um the goals that we set at the beginning of the year let us not forget those god god i pray over the rest of the year the second half of the year lord help us to um do what it takes to raise money raise funds for speed the light we know it's very very important to help grow the gospel and to spread it for your for your glory god God, we love you tonight, and we thank you for everything that you've given us, and thank you for our blessings. Amen. All right, guys. Hey, know that we believe in you. We believe in the people God is creating you to be. He's creating you to be world changers who will make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't ever lose that. Whether you become a pastor, whether you become a worship leader, small group leader, a teacher, whether you become a lawyer, a doctor, whether you become a teacher, whatever you become, you're always a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know it might feel like we're in a fishbowl. You're not. But we are called to make good choices. So go out there and make them. Go out there and love God. Go out there and love your friends. Go out there, lead well, understand your influence. We love you. We know you can do it. You're going to change the world. We'll see you later. <laughs>